Welcome to the cutting edge of the global awakening. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. Well, it looks like the North Tower of the World Trade Center has just completely collapsed. The U.S. dollar's status as the preeminent reserve currency is under attack. This is a mathematical fact. Tens of trillions of dollars are being extracted from the United States of America. You really want the truth? Then just follow the money. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio, a broadcast dedicated to your personal, spiritual, and financial liberty. And now, here's your voice of reason in the midst of global chaos, economist and best-selling author, Jerry Robinson. Ah, good morning to you, friends. Welcome to Follow the Money Weekly Radio. So glad that you're joining me this morning. We are, uh, well, we we had kind of an interesting week as you look out across uh, the world. The world markets, you look at the U.S. stock markets here, you take a look at what's happening, and you realize that we really are living in calamitous times. I mean, there's just no way around it. These are tough times, and there's a lot of money being made in the markets, but at the same time, the economic indicators and the economic news that I'm looking at on a weekly basis just continue to confirm our theory that we have dug ourselves a very big hole here in the United States, as they have in Japan and as they have in other areas that have outrageous astronomical debt levels. But the U.S. just takes the cake. You've got to give it to them. They have the largest, I say they, it's actually me and you, we have accumulated the largest debt in world history, nearing now $17 trillion for the uh, U.S. national debt, and I hope you're sitting down, over $120 trillion in unfunded obligations that we have promised to pay to those who have paid into Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. But you know just as well as I do that there's no money sitting somewhere in a savings account with your name on it so that they can pay you that money. That money comes in. And then, of course, it's often misappropriated, like what George W. Bush once said. President Bush once said that uh, the Social Security Trust Fund is uh, kind of a paradox because there is no trust and there is no fund. Well, he's partially right. There is some money stored away, but it can be borrowed. And we're seeing the same thing now by uh, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, who made uh, the comment this week that he was taking money out of pension plans for government employees, and, of course, they're going to pay it back, but that's what they always say. The problem is they have all of these demands, they have all of these obligations, and at some point they're going to have to make the payments. Now think about where we are right now. We have 10,000 baby boomers, the biggest generation here in the United States, just as they're coming now to reaching retirement, 10,000 a day are retiring. Just think about that number, 10,000 baby boomers every single day. And I wrote about the very first one who actually retired. She was the very first baby boomer. I did a write-up on her in the book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. And it was a big hubbub because she actually applied for her Social Security benefits online in front of a you know press conference. And they're trying to get baby boomers now to apply for their Social Security benefits online. But 10000 a day, that's a tremendous strain upon an already bankrupt system. And the only way to pay for all of this is just for us to get wise and get smart. And, you know, stop spending as much as we're spending. Stop the insanity when it comes to, you know, borrowing money. As if, you know, we can continue to do it from other nations. We continue to borrow from all of these different nations. And there's just no common sense anymore. It seems like all the common sense is out the window. And now you look at the stock market and you see that it's rising. And, of course, why is it rising? Well, it's rising because the Federal Reserve is pumping in $1 trillion every single year into the economy. And that creates a lot of liquidity and confidence because now... The American investor, the U.S. investor, believes that he will constantly be propped up by fresh capital infusions by 
the Federal Reserve. So don't worry. If the market begins to tank, uh, Ben Bernanke and the Fed will come in and they'll step in and they'll begin to provide more liquidity into the markets. And this is a terrible place for us to be. It may sound like it's a decent temporary fix, but it, what it's doing, what the Fed has done with all of its money pumping, is it has distorted the basic business cycle. I don't know if any of you remember the business cycle from high school. Maybe they don't teach it in high school, but I know they teach it in college. If you take a business class, you learn about the business cycle. You know how you know business cycle goes you know down into a trough and then it moves up into a recovery area and then it moves up to a peak and then it begins to fall back down and it just that over and over that cyclical nature of business that has been distorted many economists today have no clue where we are in the business cycle because of all of the money that's been pumped into the system has distorted just basic economics and so we have that plus we have very strange now investor expectations this week especially i'm not a big jim kramer fan i have watched the show a few times he's in, he's in, definitely entertaining to watch but he made the comment and he's very true on this he said that now all of the good news that's coming out for the united states economy any good news that comes out is now being viewed negatively by us investors because it means that maybe the Fed will slow down their money pump, right? Because if the economy kind of takes off and begins to go, then maybe, you know, Bernanke won't need to pump in any more money. And so it's interesting that, you know, the good economic news that normally boosts an economy is now working against us as investors. So you can see how upside down all of this is. And it makes it very difficult for people like you and I you know, to put money into the marketplace and to really have any kind of confidence as to which direction it's going to go based upon news. You know, on Thursday, we saw a flash crash in uh, Japan. Now, the Nikkei was down about 7.3% and began to recover you know, throughout the day. But just a, another classic example of you know, all there really was, I mean, Japan really didn't have anything major going on. They're definitely due for a pullback. And I hope that um, anyone who sees that pullback in Japan views it as a buying opportunity. Well, I certainly did. Scooping up more shares and adding to my positions in Japan on Thursday. Because there is no fundamental reason for the market to go down. They have propped it up and they're going to continue to prop it up. And Japan is probably going to end very badly, the whole situation, the whole experiment that they're doing. But in the meantime, there's money to be made. And the trend is your friend. I want to talk a little bit about some wise investing tips today. I want to talk to you about some of that. Kind of a different show. We are going to have Jay Peroni. We're going to have uh, John Burrs on the program today. We know we'll have all of our regular segments. But uh, I, we're not going to have an interview today. We're just going to focus a little bit on some strategies for you wise investing tips we'll talk about that let's talk about some news first before we do We've got several headlines here from the week first of all the ecb the european central bank is talking now about expanding its monetary policy meaning that if need be they are going to pump more money into the economy and they have already said that they promised that they wouldn't go to negative interest rates the way that japan tried but uh, we don't know if that's true or not we shall see. Let's see here. Also, we uh, saw the Bank of Japan this week decide to stand pat. Basically, they're not moving. They're going to continue their current monetary policy, the conter uh, their current monetary easing. But they're not going to cut rates or change anything as of this month. And so we're going to be continue watching Japan. But my favorite way to play Japan is a ticker symbol. It's DXJ, DXJ. And that is the Wisdom Tree Hedged Japan Fund. It's an ETF, DXJ. It's the way that I play Japan. And in fact, I should give you a disclosure that I do own it. So I do have vested interest in that particular ETF, but that's how I play it. And if you look at it compared to most other ETFs in Japan, it's one of the safer, I think, safer ways to play 
Japan because it offers a hedge against its currency. Yeah, and the Nikkei fell pretty hard on Thursday, and really most of it had to do with nothing really in Japan, but negative data coming out of China, negative manufacturing data showing that possibly China is contracting for the second quarter in a row. According to the latest estimates that I saw, the PMI, which is the uh, the manufacturing index in China, the latest report released was 49.6. And all that means is anytime the number is above 50, that means that manufacturing is expanding. And anytime the number is below 50, it means that manufacturing is contracting. And the numbers came in at 49.6. So negative news for China. And of course, Japan is dependent upon China in many ways. And so the investors or the investors there took it hard and sold off. Now, no doubt, as I mentioned before, Japan needs to have a breather. It's been going straight up practically for the whole year, especially after uh, Shinzo Abe, the new central banker uh, who's running the whole central bank there, uh, the central bank governor, began to uh, issue just a tremendously aggressive monetary policy. So he spooked a lot of people, and he drove a lot of people into the markets because they realized that he was bound and determined to inflate the stock market and create a wealth effect the same way that Ben Bernanke has been trying to do here in the United States. We've talked about that extensively. Let's see what else. Uh, Bernanke spoke this week. We told you, and especially all of our FTM insiders, to watch very closely on Wednesday to the language. And sure enough, on Wednesday, Bernanke did slip up. Basically, he told Congress on Wednesday that the U.S. job market remains weak and that it's too soon for the Federal Reserve to slow its stimulus program. And that's pretty much what we had expected. However, he did make this statement. He said that reducing the Fed's efforts to keep borrowing rates low would, quote, carry a substantial risk of slowing or ending the economic recovery. And that, of course, was not received well by investors. Basically, the Fed is propping up the economy. And if the Fed goes away or if the Fed stops what it's doing, the economy and the economic recovery, quote unquote, goes away. Later, the minutes were released at 2 o'clock or on Wednesday, 2 o'clock Eastern time, showing that some Fed officials had believed that it was time to start tapering the QE as early as June. Now, that was not something new. We had talked about that. Our FTM insiders had known about that because we follow these Fed officials as they speak around the country, and they came out in full force last week and began you know, sharing a lot of comments. So we knew that they were talking about uh, possibly ending the QE as early as June. But we also knew that Bernanke was not part of that fold, so to speak. Him and others like Yellen and several others on the Fed board were not in favor of ending monetary easing anytime soon, nor tapering it off, at least until the fourth quarter of this year. And in fact, Bernanke did slip up during his testimony before the Economic Committee in Congress and did say that if they did begin to taper back, it might be sometime around the fourth quarter. And that spooked the markets also. But the minutes showed that some Fed officials want to begin pulling things back as early as this summer. And for some reason, that was enough to send stocks down pretty hard toward the end of the day on Wednesday. And again, I thought that was a buying opportunity because we already knew that. We already knew that they were talking about June, but we also know that that's not going to happen because Bernanke has already said that if they even try that, it could end the economic recovery. That's the last thing that these guys want to do, especially when you consider the new disinflation that has been showing up in the numbers. And disinflation, if you remember from last week, is simply a contraction in the current inflation rate. And that's what we have here in the United States. That's what we're also seeing in many other developed countries of the world, that inflation is slowing. And you ask yourself, the same way I ask myself, how in the world can the world pump so much fresh currency into the economies and 
C, disinflation. How is inflation not rising? And the reason is very simple. The velocity of money is not high enough. And velocity of money is when people take money and they begin to inject it themselves into the economy. They go out and they take their paycheck and they spend. Business people get their money and then they invest. You know, and so that's the velocity of money. And right now we see corporations sitting on a ton of cash. We see bankers still not wanting to loan money. We see consumers, although consumer spending is still very healthy, we are seeing some strange behaviors in consumer spending. So overall, the velocity of money is not where it needs to be to create that type of inflation. And that's what the Fed is trying to do. The Fed is trying to create inflation. They've already said that. I don't know how many times we want to create inflation and they don't want it to be too bad. And once they actually get it going to the place where they believe it's okay, our thesis is that they're going to be too late because they will not be able to rein in the inflation once it actually hits. Now we put up a chart for all of our FTM insiders that showed that the last two major tops in the S&P 500 occurred in 2000 and in the year 2007. And since then, we, after bottoming out in the early part of 2009, the stock market rally has gone back up. And obviously it's been aided this time by Herculean type of monetary policy, $1 trillion per year now that they're pumping in. And the last two rallies in the S&P in 2000 and in 2007, where they finally topped out, sure, there was monetary intervention. We've Ever since we've had the Fed, we've had monetary intervention. But never in the history of the world have we had this type of monetary intervention that we're experiencing right now in 2013. So recently... The S&P 500 broke out to a brand new all-time high. And the way that I feel about this is important. I want to express this to you. I want you to understand where I'm coming from here because for those of you who are invested in the markets, this is really our thesis. Because there has been so much money pumped into the economy, and if you look at a chart of the S&P, just you know, do it. Do a 20-year chart. Look at a 20-year chart. And if you're an FTM insider, just look at the chart we made and we kind of put some information on it you can see. But take a look at that 20-year chart, and you'll see the two tops that I'm talking about. Look at the year 2007 and look at the year 2000, and you'll see that both of them kind of acted as a ceiling, and the index came back down. But when you look at the recent rally that began in 2009, it was inspired by all of this fresh cash being pumped in by the Fed, you'll see that it broke out past both of those previous tops. And my thesis is basically this. It's going to continue higher because we are in uncharted territory. If you look at the chart since 2009, you'll see how it has, the Fed has almost been trying to kickstart this economy. You'll see how it goes up and then it'll come back down and then it goes up and then it comes back down and then it goes up again. And what the Fed is doing, it's almost like it's starting a lawnmower. You know, it's just trying to get this thing revved up. And they finally have uh, got it to a place where people are feeling good about the stock market, but they've already taken it past the previous highs. And so we have nothing to compare any of this to. So we, we're totally in uncharted territory. That's where we are now. And as an investor, that makes everybody pretty nervous. So you should expect a lot of volatility going forward because many people don't know how to act in this new environment. They have no frame of reference. They have nothing that they can look at to say, well, the S&P, especially the technical analysts who are looking at the charts, they don't know where the S&P is going to end up. There's no way to know. But I can tell you, based upon all the money that's been pumped in, I believe that we are going to see a historic high in many of the indices over the course of the next several months. And of course, there'll be crashes. Of course, there'll be major pullbacks and corrections. But right now, the market is still solidly green. For those of you who subscribe to our subscription area, you can see that. And it's solidly green. That means that the uptrend is fully intact, despite the selling that we've been seeing. And we have had a few periods, uh, a few, in fact, a couple of days this week of some pretty strong selling. And 
what the way we mark these sales, you know, when we take a look at a sell off in the market, what we're looking for is a sell off on higher volume than the previous day. So if the stock market actually sells off, but it's lighter volume than the previous day, we don't care. That's not a big deal. But if the market goes down, and if you look at the volume level and you see that it's above the previous day, that's not a good sign. And if you get too many of those days in a four to five week period, that indicates that major institutions are selling. And major institutions, I'm referring to hedge funds, I'm referring to mutual funds, I'm referring to major outfits on Wall Street. And these are the people, these are the titans, they're the ones who move the markets. People like you and I cannot possibly move the markets. All we can do is follow the trends. And so we have to pay very close attention to what the institutions are doing. That's why the show is called Follow the Money. We pay attention to where the money is going. And right now, the institutions are buying, but we have had a few days of heavy institutional selling. And so we keep our eyes on those. And once we rack up a few of those, it's time to start locking in our profits. It's time to start tightening up our stop losses and getting ready to raise cash because once the market dips back down again, we want to be buyers. Uh, I don't know how many people had courage back in 2009 who are listening to me now to buy whenever there was blood in the streets. Back in March of 2009, there are several stocks since that period that have gone up thousands of percent percentage points. And, you know, but it took a lot of guts to step into a market like in March of 2009 and say, I'm buying. I think it would have been foolish to do that. Instead, you want to wait till you begin to see the rally begin. And that was the next, you know, couple of months. And in fact, that's exactly what our indicator system that we use here, the green, yellow, and red light showed. It got us out of the market prior to the major, major dip. And then it gave us a green light after March, after the final bottom in 2009, indicating that it was time to get back in. So a lot of that bloody mess can be missed if you just follow the money, if you just pay attention to what the big boys are doing on Wall Street. Because, again, they're the ones who play this game. And you and I, while we can't move the markets the way that they do, we can also exploit the markets if we watch them because they really can't make any moves without everybody watching. But you and I can. Nobody's paying attention to you and I, right? We can go in there and buy 100 shares or 1,000 shares, and nobody cares, and nobody sees. But when these major outfits go and they buy or sell you know, 100,000 share lots, I mean, everybody sees that, and everybody knows it. And so we have that benefit of being stealth, and they don't. So use it to your benefit as an investor. Okay, let's see. we got a few more stories before I hop in and share with you some investing tips that I wanted to share. What else is in the news? Oh, this is interesting. Over in Israel, in the Sea of Galilee. By the way, if you've never been to Israel, you need to go. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. The Sea of Galilee. Underneath the Sea of Galilee, here's a story from the AP. Massive submerged structure stumps Israeli archaeologists. Putting all the data together, researchers found that the structure that is beneath the Sea of Galilee is a structure that is cone-shaped, about 230 feet in diameter and about 32 feet tall. It weighs an estimated 60,000 tons. It's a circular structure, and it's down at the bottom of the sea. It's a man-made, some sort of a structure here, and it looks like they're going to be going down and taking a look at it. It looks like it might give us some insights into some of the ancient life back in the Middle East. Always curious about that. I like to keep my eyes on a lot of the archaeological finds that pop up. I'll try to share those with you whenever I see them. Let's see what else here in the news that we need to talk about. The Fed has been pumping money into foreign banks. Yeah, that's an old story. Over a trillion dollars now they've pumped into foreign banks. That's your money that they're pumping in. GMOs in the news. If you don't know about genetically modified foods, uh, definitely check that out. Oh, oh I need to tell you. FTM flicks.com it's a brand new site that jennifer and i have developed oh probably about a month ago jennifer and i what we do is we watch a lot of tv on the internet we don't have cable you know i just cables to me it's just a it's just too expensive for what you get and so we just watch stuff online 
we have Netflix and we have Hulu and we have some of these different things. We'll watch shows on there. We'll watch documentaries especially. Well, what we did was we decided to create our own little website and put all of our favorite documentaries on there. And not just favorite ones, but also ones that we wanted to watch. So it's like a big, huge queue for us to watch. And it has everything from biblical history to economics to politics, geopolitics, science, technology. And, you know, it's a growing website. You know, obviously it's just something that her and I are doing in our spare time. We'll add movies or documentaries to it or shows to it. And then in the evening time, when we finally get to sit down, we'll pick a show off of that website that we're creating. So we think it's pretty neat. Now, you can actually go there and see what we have. It's a really nice-looking website. It's FTM, like follow the money, FTM Flicks, just like Netflix, right? F-L-I-X, F-T-M-F-L-I-X.com. And what's neat about the site, besides you being able to go there and watch you know, some cool documentaries, which, by the way, there is one called The Revelations of the Pyramids that blew our minds. You've got to watch this documentary. If you like documentaries and you're curious about ancient Egypt and the pyramids and all of this, how they come about, wow, what a great uh, documentary. I thought it was interesting. It's called The Revelation of the Pyramids. You can go to ftmflix.com and watch the full documentary right there. But what's neat about that website is you can go there, and at the very top right, it says Add a Video. Well, you can come in and add some of your favorite documentaries, some of your favorite TV shows, some of your favorite stuff. So if you find a, a link on YouTube or Vimeo or Vidler or some one of these video websites, just simply upload that. All you have to do is have the URL, and you can upload it and title it, and you can share it with our audience, and uh, we can all kind of collaborate together and put up some great videos and create a nice alternative, family-friendly alternative especially. There's so much garbage out there people have to watch on cable. Okay, so anyway, I had to plug that real quickly because that's kind of neat. We don't make any money off of it. It's free, but it's something we wanted to share with you. Okay, here's a story about real estate. I do want to talk about real estate for a minute. First of all, the student loan crisis, which I connect to real estate quite often, is important. Overdue student loans reach an all-time high as students struggle to find work after college, according to a government report. Overdue student loans at all-time high. Now, Listen to this staggering statistic from the U.S. Education Department. Almost 30% of 20 to 24-year-olds living in the United States are unemployed or, or they're not in school, the study found. Almost 30% of 20 to 24-year-olds. That's a huge number. That's a huge number. And many of these youngsters are not getting the right start to their career and it's going to hurt them in the future. And now we have a student loan crisis that's over $1 trillion. And on top of that, these uh, youngsters have student loans, the ones who actually went to school, and then they have credit card debt, and many times they have mortgages now. It's just unreal. You know mortgage, by the way, the word mortgage in Latin, it comes from two words, uh, mort, which is the root word for mortal, which means death, for a lack of a better word, and then gauge, which means to grip. And so mortgage is death grip. It's what it means in the Latin. So that's exactly what a mortgage is when you write that check out or you make that payment. You know who owns your house. Well, just don't make that mortgage payment for a while. You'll find out real quickly who owns that house. It has your name on the bill that comes in the mail, but guess whose name is on the house of the bank? So they will get their money or they will get their house, one of the two. And that's exactly what many of these young people now have. They're living in a death grip, death grip of student loans, a death grip of home payments, a death grip of consumer debt and credit card debt. And now listen to this. According to Zillow.com, that's a neat website if you haven't been there before, but Zillow, which is a Seattle-based real estate data company, said that 44% of homeowners in the United States with mortgages owed more than their properties are worth. It's unreal. Let me say this again. 44% of homeowners in the United States with mortgages owed more than their properties are worth, or they had less than 20% equity in the first quarter of 2013. All right, so 44% of current homeowners here in the United States with mortgages either 
owe more than their house is worth or they have less than 20% equity in the first quarter. So what this means is, is that almost half of the houses out there cannot even be sold. A, because the homeowner can't get what he owes on it, so he would have to sell it at a loss. And B, you know, you've almost got to have about 20% of a house payment of an overall house sales price to be able to afford to sell a house and then buy a new one because you've got to come up with a down payment for the new place. And if you're selling your first one upside down, how in the world are you going to come up with any cash to get your new place? So it's better just to stay put. Therefore, there's a lack of inventory on the real estate market today, and that's hurting overall sales. Because believe it or not, there are people coming out of the woodwork now who have not bought a house, who are ready to buy a house, and yet the inventory is very low. So it's not just that people are not wanting to put their houses on the market right now in 2013 because they believe they're not going to get enough money for their house or they want to, you know, they want to wait for the market to be better. That's obviously part of it. But another big part of it that's not talked about too much is the fact that these people can't put their house in the market because they would sell it at a loss. Their house is not worth what they owe on it. So that's certainly a problem. And that is one of the reasons why I have said over and over again since the beginning of this millennia, since 2000, 2001, 2002, we began preaching the importance of rental real estate. We are turning into a renter nation. Student loan crisis the way that it is, the young people who are not even investing in the markets, they have no clue how to invest, they're financially illiterate, they're not really interested in buying a home, and so they're renting. And that can be a very good thing for baby boomers who have some money saved up somewhere. You don't always have to be all in stocks. You can take some of that money out and you can purchase a piece of rental real estate. Well, there's some cheap deals out there, especially if you pay cash for a cheap house. Certainly, it's not always the smartest thing to do to pay cash. It's usually much better to get a fixed rate loan. But regardless, real estate really is a good place to be if you buy smart, buy in the right areas, use a fixed interest rate, and then rent out your properties. That can really be a decent stream of income that uh, will be very reliable for you in the long haul. Let's take a look at the Vatican here real quickly before we move on to some wise stock investing tips that I want to share with you today. Pope Francis, the brand new Pope, which by the way, I think I told you last week, we're going to have Chris Putnam on and possibly Tom Horn to talk about the Vatican and in particular, the Vatican Bank, which I reported to you last week for the very first time ever is going to be audited by an independent auditor. We'll see how independent that audit is. I'm really curious because they've said all kinds of terrible things over the years about the Vatican Bank and what it's been used for. But uh, speaking of the Vatican Bank and speaking of money and the Vatican and all this, Pope Francis blames world's financial woes on cult of money. The Pope blames the world's current financial crisis, at least in part, on a global, quote, cult of money, unquote. He says the worship of the golden calf of biblical times has been replaced with a new and heartless image, that of money. Well, no disagreement with that, no doubt about it, that men truly do serve money in this country. How can anyone argue with that? It truly is what we put our trust in, and that's unfortunate. We shouldn't do that. It's not something that's right, but we do it regardless. And the Pope also this week had said something that I disagree with. He said that uh, in addition to the cult of money, which I do agree with, he said that atheists, as long as they're good, they're okay. Well, that's not what the Bible says. That's certainly not what the Catholic Church has historically taught. And basically what he is saying is that atheists, people who do not believe in God, as long as they're good, then they're fine and we can all get along. He's also made comments that, you know, it's okay if you're another religion. Everybody loves God. We're all spokes on one big wheel. It all leads to the same place in the end. So everybody just, you know, hug and get along and everything will be hunky-dory. Well, it's unfortunate for a man who is leading the world's largest single religious institution in the world to say, especially considering that he believes that he sits in the seat of Peter, the original Apostle Peter, who died for his faith on a cross upside down because he did not want to die the same way that his Savior 
had died, according to history. And how unfortunate that Peter, who denied all other forms of truth and said only, only Christ is the way, and now we have the new pope who sits in the seat of Peter, supposedly, saying, well, it doesn't matter who you are. You can even not believe in God, and yeah, you're fine. Well, the Bible says that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. The Bible calls people who don't believe in God a fool. That's pretty harsh language. The Pope is not taking his cues from the Bible, apparently. He's taking them from somewhere else, and that's unfortunately nothing new. Okay, let's talk about wise stock investing. I want to give you five or six tips on wise stock investing. We'll do that in just a minute. Several years ago, but I began learning how to trade stocks, I guess it was 1997, 1997, 1996, somewhere in there, I began trading my very first stock. And I remember how excited I was. I remember how foolish I was also. I didn't have any rules. I had no clue what I was doing. And now looking back, you know, I'm making a huge list of rules and all of this. And it's all going in a little booklet that's coming out called The Trade of Trading for all of our current FTM insiders and also for all of our trigger trade report subscribers, those who get a trade a day. We put out one trading idea every single day along with our general market indicator to tell you, you know, if it's green, red, or yellow. But uh, anyway, long story short, put together several rules. I wanted to share about five of these with you today. And these are rules for wise stock investing. These are just things I've learned over the years that I feel very strongly about. There's many more than just five, but I just want to share five today. Number one is never double down. Let me explain what that means. It's okay if you go in and purchase a stock. Let's say you buy a stock at $25. You place the order. The stock is at $25. And then let's say, you know how Murphy's Law sometimes operates. Let's say that the stock begins to go down in value. Let's say it drops down to 24 And then you think to yourself, well... Look, it's cheaper. I think I'll add some now. And so you go ahead and buy another 100 shares or whatever at 24. No, 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 no. Wrong. Never double down. And that's exactly what double down means. It means when you buy a particular position and then it turns against you, it goes down, you buy more. Never add to your position if the stock has fallen below your purchase price. Let me say this again. Never Add to your current position if the stock has fallen below your purchase price. That is not a smart strategy for a wise stock investor. Now, this does not apply to every single asset under the sun, but it does apply to those who are trying to use stocks uh, to gain leverage in the overall markets and to get you know some good returns. It's okay to add to your current position of stocks when a stock is trending higher and it's in the black. So let's take that same $25 stock. Let's say it goes up to 26 And then maybe it pulls back a little bit to about twenty five seventy five. That's okay to add more. It's okay to add more when the stock is rising. Never add more stock when the stock goes below your initial purchase price. It's very, very important. And I know sometimes people may build the case and say, well, I could really improve my cost basis by doing this with a stock, but that's not a wise thing to do when it comes to the stock market. So never double down. That is rule number one. It's always, always, always a bad idea. It may work out every now and then, but usually it's not a good idea. So it's one of my big rules. I never double down in the stock market ever, ever, ever. Okay, number two, don't be a bottom feeder. Don't be a bottom feeder. While it's true that some investors have successfully bought cheap stocks that eventually rally, this is the exception, not the rule. The best stocks to buy, and this may be hard for you to accept, it certainly was hard for me to accept when I first began investing, but I can tell you, 
you know, after 16 years of trading and investing and using the stock market to my benefit and, you know, making money from the stock market year in and year out, I can tell you that having bought cheap stocks and having bought good price stocks, the cheap stocks may eventually rally, but that's the exception, not the rule. The best stocks to buy if your goal is to beat the overall market are the leaders, the stocks that are leading, the stocks that are closer to their 52-week high, not to their 52-week low. Focus on high-quality stocks, and of course they're going to be higher priced. But these higher price quality stocks are the ones that historically have gone up during times of a bull market. And so it's always important to focus on stocks that are high quality, focus on stocks that are nearer to their 52-week high than they are to their 52-week low. That may sound counterintuitive. It may sound like it's not a smart idea, but I can promise you over the years that that one rule right there has saved me a lot of money and a lot of grief. Instead of trying to bottom feed and go in the very bottom and find the really, really, really cheap down and out stocks, I instead look for the stocks that are already strong and moving and have good earnings and have good sales growth and sales projections. That's how I focus on finding the good stocks out of the nearly 10,000 stocks that are available to us on the exchanges. All right, so that's number two. Don't be a bottom feeder. Number one, never double down. Number two, don't be a bottom feeder. Number three, avoid sales hype and opinion. Most financial commentators on television and on radio do not have excellent long-term track records of consistently beating the S&P 500 index. One of the easiest ways to always match the S&P 500 is just to buy the S&P 500 ETF, and that's ticker symbol SPY. So if you just want to you know, get the S&P 500 gains every single year, SPY that the ETF beats about 80% of money managers every single year. 80% of money managers cannot beat the ticker symbol SPY on an annual basis. So if you just want to make sure that you're getting the market return, that's what you can do. You can use SPY. But again, instead of basing your stock purchases upon some analyst opinion or some hyped up press release designed to attract suckers, which you know <laughs> put out all the time, conduct your own analysis on the stock to determine if its future looks bright. So it's very important to avoid sales hype and opinion. And let me give you another example of this. Going back to the reason we call this show Follow the Money, the sales hype that's out there and the opinions, people saying, well, I think the market's going to go up or I think the market is going to go down. How do we know? which direction the markets. None of us know. None of us have a crystal ball. So when we look at the stock market, and I want you to pay attention here because I'm talking about stocks. Every market has its own nature to it. Although most markets are similar in many ways, stocks are a unique beast. And the way that they operate and the way that the mentality of the investors is, it's different than some other markets. So let's say the futures market or something like that. So when it comes to stocks, what's very important is to realize that you cannot possibly know which direction the market's going to go. All you can do is invest with the direction of the market. So if the market's going up, don't try to short. Go long. If the market is going down, don't try to be a renegade and find out you know a stock that's going up. Instead, short the market. Just learn to follow the trends, and you will see that most of the major, major money earners on Wall Street are not brilliant people who have crystal balls, but instead they understand how to ride a trend. The people who have made money in gold since 2001, 2002, are the ones who saw and they bought and they helped. And they have made a lot of money in gold and silver, you know, the same way with, when the rally began uh, later on in 2005 or so. But uh, avoid sales hype and opinion. Nobody can know what the market's going to do tomorrow. So that's why we have our green light, yellow light, red light. When the market is moving and trending higher, it's green. When that trending higher begins to have pressure, it turns yellow. When the market actually begins to correct, we change it to red. We're not going to guess where it's going. We're going to tell you where it is. Where it is and is the only thing that we can know. We can't know where it's going, but we can know where it is. So invest based upon where it is. And I know that may sound, again, counterintuitive. All these rules are probably going to sound counterintuitive, 
But as an, a wise investor, if you want to stay in the game for the long haul, you have to begin applying some of these rules. Number four, cut your losses quickly. This one will bite you if you don't pay close attention to it. One of the cardinal sins of investing is to allow a position to experience double-digit losses. Warren Buffett, who is the world's largest investor, most successful investor, his number one rule of investing is this, don't lose money. His number two rule is see num rule number one. So don't lose money is uh, his major adage. Wise investors use stop loss orders to protect against the downside. My own personal threshold for a loss is somewhere between seven, eight, nine percent, somewhere in there below my initial purchase price. So if I believe based upon a current trend, like for example, with Japan, let's just use Japan for example. Let's say that I woke up, I looked at the markets and I say, wow, Japan's in a massive rally. Well, I don't know how long it's going to last, but it's certainly the train is moving towards the north. And so I'm going to hop on that train and ride it as far as I can take it, right? And so I buy DXJ, for example, I mentioned earlier, which I own. And I ride that higher. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to immediately, after I buy it, I'm going to immediately place a stop loss order beneath it about an 8%. So let's say that the stock is $10 or ETF is $10 that I'm looking at. Then I'm going to immediately place a stop loss order at 8% below my purchase price, which would be 80 cents. So that's $10 minus 80 cents. That's $9 and 20 cents. If the stock drops down to $9 and 20 cents, I am not going to think about selling it. I'm not going to talk to my wife about selling it. I'm not going to you know, do anything else. I'm going to sell it. It's going to automatically sell because the stop loss is in place. It automatically triggers a sell. And what I do is I realize I was wrong. I lick my wounds and I move on. But let me tell you, I have sat on 40, 50, and 60% losses. And let me tell you, that does not feel good. And then you have to wait for the market to come back just to break even. Okay, so that's not a good way to invest. That's a not a very good way to invest at all. Instead, cut your losses short. Cut them quickly and do not sit on massive losses and think that they're eventually going to go up. Don't lose money. That's one of the best ways to make money in the markets is to not lose it. So again, my own personal threshold is about 8% on a stop loss. It's pretty much across the board. Every now and then I'll increase it to 9. On a couple, I've even done 10. And the way that I determine them is I look and see how far the current stock or ETF is above its 50-day moving average. Let's move on to number five. This is the final rule that we'll have time for. And that is learn how to use the 50-day moving average. So rule number four, cut your losses early. Number five, learn to use the 50-day moving average. So let me explain to you how I use this. And we'll also talk about how I use it to create a stop loss. When a stock breaks out of a major pattern, like a technical pattern of some sort, and it is leading the overall market higher, which means that it's outperforming the market, it will often find major support near its 50-day moving average. Now, all a 50-day moving average is, is it's the last 50 days of trading, the last 10 weeks of trading, and it's plotted on a line. And so it kind of smooths out the overall trend of the current price. It helps you kind of see what direction the stock is really going. Because sometimes stock prices almost look like a yo-yo. They're up one day, down one day, up one day, down one day. But the 50-day moving average smooths out all that price action, and it just lays it on a nice plotted line. And you can see, okay, is it moving up over that 50-day period, or is it moving down over that 50-day period? So you're able to see really what's happening. And what I do is I use that 50-day moving average because many times a stock, if it's above the 50-day moving average, it will come down. And if it touches that 50-day moving average, it will often find support there. If it crosses below it, oftentimes that's a negative sign for traders, and so they'll start selling. So I always apply a 50-day moving average onto a particular stock chart when I'm looking at it because that is one of the most important metrics that you can use to determine what's happening with a given stock at any particular time. Now, I use other 
moving averages as well. I use a 10 day simple day moving average. I use a 30 exponential moving average. I use a 200 day moving average. So I use all these others as well. And we're not going to talk about those now, but the main one, the really important one to really always pay attention to is the 50 day moving average. If a stock is above the 50 day moving average, it's doing well. If it's below its 50 day moving average, it's not performing so well. So you can often tell real quickly how a stock is doing by looking at it as compared to its 50-day moving average. Now, you can use any kind of stock charting service you want to use to look at these. I use a couple. I use a Market Club, and I use Stock Charts, and uh, actually a few others. But you can go to Yahoo Finance. That's a completely free one to get started, and just type in a particular stock, and then add on a 50-day moving average. And so you'll have two lines. You'll have the price of the stock, you know, like a line all the way across the uh, chart, and then you'll have this 50-day moving average line that's across the chart. If the price is above it, that's a good thing. If it's below it, it's not such a good thing. Now, that's a very broad and generic uh, statement, but uh, I think it kind of sums up well what we're saying. Now, there's obviously lots of strategies that we use with that 50-day moving average, and if you want to learn more about that, you need to become one of our FTM insiders because we talk about that. And also uh, our trigger trade report where we do a trade a day. So you can get all that information there. But listen, whenever a stock finds support near its 50-day moving average, it will often bounce up above that current price very quickly. So it's almost like a electric fence almost. I kind of view this 50-day moving average sometimes as like an electric fence. You touch it and it bounces, right? So... I look for stocks that are finding support at their 50-day moving average because they'll often go higher right after touching it. So learn to use the 50-day moving average. There's tons of great articles out on the web that you can find. One great resource is investopedia.com. Great you know, articles there. We obviously have several articles there on our own website. And typically, when a stock breaks out, this is just a little tip for you with 50-day moving average, a little strategy that I use. Whenever a stock breaks out of a major pattern, let's say that uh, it forms what they call a cup and handle or a double bottom, and if you don't know what those are, you can look those up, but you know, all of our FTM insiders have certainly heard those before because we talk about them. But whenever a stock actually forms a particular chart pattern and then it breaks out, okay, we've got a breakout stock, well, it's usually safe to add more of that stock. So let's say you buy it on the breakout. You can add to your position whenever it comes back down and touches the 50-day moving average, and then it comes back up. When it touches the 50-day moving average and begins to bounce back up, that's a very good buy signal. And so that's a great time to add to your position. You can do that about twice with a 50-day moving average before it starts not working. So once a stock breaks out, I'm not talking about after it's been you know, breaking out and it's touched the 50-day moving average 18 times. I'm talking about after it breaks out of a certain pattern and goes higher. When it comes back and touches the 50-day moving average, that's often an additional buy sell. That's saying, okay, good time to add more. And if, if it touches it one more time, that's another buy signal, time to add more. But after that, it gets dicey, and the overall statistics or odds are not necessarily in your favor. So it's a very important uh, thing to keep in mind. All of those, let me just run back through them real quickly. Number one was never double down. Number two, don't be a bottom feeder. Number three, avoid sales hype and opinion. Number four, cut your losses quickly. And number five, learn how to use the 50-day moving average. Now, I told you how I use the 50-day moving average with my stop loss. Let me tell you that real quickly. What I'll often do is I will look and see where the stock is in relation to its 50-day moving average. And I like to put my stop loss about 8% below where I bought it. Now, if it's really close to the 50-day moving average, that 8%, for example, let's say that the stock is at 50 and the 50-day uh, moving average is below it, about 8% or maybe 9%, I will often go just about 10 cents below that 50-day moving average instead of the 8%. So if your stock is like 30% above the 50-day moving average, then forget it. You know, Just do your 8%. But if it's awfully close to the 50-day moving average, I'll usually choose 10 cents below the 50-day moving average as my stop. Okay, hopefully that made sense. I don't have time to belabor that idea, but if you have questions, you can always uh, write us. I leave you with this, written by William J. O'Neill, one of the top stock investors of our generation. Just unbelievable success this guy has had. And he runs uh, Investor's Business Daily. He's written several books. 
Listen to what he says. This is a real quick quote. A successful investor learns to do what most investors are not willing to do. Psychologically, most investors do not use charts. They do not want to buy stocks making new highs, and they cannot bring themselves to cut every loss at 7, 8, 9, 10%. Even fewer can bring themselves, after selling a stock at a loss, to buy it back higher. This is the difference between successful and unsuccessful investors. So there you are, five wise stock investing strategies for you or tips to take and uh, put into your mind and begin to apply. Happy investing, everyone. We'll be right back. Follow the Money Weekly presents your precious metals market update. Here's Tom Cloud. Well, Jerry, there's been a lot of news breaking, and um, I think we start with what's going on with George Soros. He's had three reports in the last week of purchasing gold. I sent that out on an email blast to show how much he's buying, and we're seeing an increase in central bank purchasing while while purchases by people like us and clients of ours have slowed down. Now, certainly part of that is because the end of the school year, and part of it's the uh, holiday weekend coming up and the market being closed on Monday and not being able to buy again until Tuesday. So we look at all that and factor it in, and we still see that gold is in a narrow trading range. And if you look at it from a technical standpoint, it's still very neutral, uh, stuck between 1320 and 1380, but it did break out on Thursday and closed in the 1390s. If we can keep above 1380, I think you'll see a breakout on it even in June. But still, we're looking for big numbers in the fall. That continues to be the theme of everything we're hearing out of Europe and our sources, including the suppliers, about the inquiries of large fiscal and gold orders to be delivered in the fall. But I think we just kind of watch. There's not any reason at this point to run out, but certainly in silver, I would recommend you just keep accumulating. The premiums did come down a little bit this week after going up for three times in seven weeks. We did get a little drop this week, especially in the Silver Eagles, and the delivery time has dropped about a week and a half. So we're starting to see things coming back and catching up in the delivery area, which is good for getting our orders caught up and getting things delivered to our clients. But the big news on the metals has been the plating and platinum with Doug Casey coming out with the buy signal. And, of course, if you look this year, you have silver down over 20% and gold down 15%, and you have platinum and plating both up and platinum $100 higher than gold when they started the year at the same thing. And both these metals have gone up, and with the situation continue to be very stressful in South Africa for supply in both platinum and palladium and the strike situation partially resolved, partially not resolved, you can just look for platinum and platinum to continue to go up. And uh, Casey continues to believe, as does quite a few of our sources in Europe, that platinum and palladium will be the top two metals for the year 2013. I mentioned this even on our first show this year, Jerry, that it looked to us like palladium, from a technical standpoint, would be the biggest win winner in 2013, and I haven't changed a bit on that. The only risk our listeners need to remember, the only thing to be negative for palladium would be if we had a worldwide recession and we had a sharp decrease in demand for automobiles. If that were to happen, certainly plating would pull back. But I look at a great time this summer to accumulate platinum and palladium and silver for sure and gold when it does break out. I think it's headed right back to 1665 where it started the year. And I've had a lot of calls over the last couple of weeks that I think gold will have its 13th straight up year. My answer is yes. Even with it being down 16%, for the year, I still expect it to recover and close above 1665 by the end of the year. So, once again, it cannot be a bad time to buy gold, but it could get less over the next, you know, 10 weeks until we expect the 
large move in the, starting by mid-August for the last four months of the year in all the metals. If people are not getting the email blast, they should be getting it. We send it out completely confidential. We don't share anybody's email, but they could go to ftmdaily.com, hit the precious metals button and sign up for our email blast that go out a couple times a week, keeping people abreast of what's going on in the economic world, our specials, when to get in and out of different metals. So, you know, if they'll just sign up with that, we'll add it. If you have any questions, especially about IRAs and rare coins, we still are getting a lot of questions about the validity of having rare coins as an investment and also can you own physical metals in an IRA. And people can reach me at 800-247-2812. That's 800-247-2812. And just mention that you heard me on FTM Daily and any orders you do, we'll throw in free shipping and insurance. With this week's Precious Metals Market Update, this is Tom Cloud signing out. Jay Peroni, Certified Financial Planner, here with the Idea of the Week. This week, we'll take a look at a company that is innovating and changing the world around us. The Tomorrow's Treasures Portfolio focuses on finding tomorrow's leading companies today. In order to spot trends, I look for companies that are innovating and changing the world around us. Imagine getting in on a company like Apple before they mass-produced the iPod. Or what about Tesla Motors before electric cars were a reality? You get my point. Getting there early can lead to huge profits. One of my favorite areas of innovation right now is 3D printing. After decades of development, which was once reserved for science fiction movies, is now a possibility. Remember the Jetsons? Many of those technologies are now possible, 3D printing being one of them. Additive manufacturing is finally getting a lot of publicity. This is quickly leading to strong demand and profitability for firms in the 3D printing space. One of my favorites in this industry is Stratasys, ticker symbol SSYS. Stratasys manufactures 3D printers that allow engineers and designers to create working prototypes of CAD design models. The company also generates roughly one-third of revenue from its on-demand parts manufacturing business, which delivers parts printed on 3D printers for customers that send a CAD file. Here are three reasons why I like Stratasys. Number one, its recent acquisition of Objet makes Stratasys the largest manufacturer of 3D printing equipment for the professional market. This is a rapidly expanding market, and in the future, this could be one key market segment for Stratasys. Number two, the company has a very impressive track record of both growth and profitability and being able to survive in both up and down market cycles. Number three, the company's singular focus on plastic should make it the leader in the 3D space. This should also allow it to carve out more profitable niches, potentially blocking future competitors. Stratasys is a good buy up to $85 a share. This company has delivered a 22% annualized return over the past 15 years, and I do not see this trend slowing down. Again, that's Stratasys, ticker symbol SSYS, worth a closer look. This is Jay Peroni, Certified Financial Planner, signing off for the Idea of the Week. We'll see you again next week. All right. Well, Jay Peroni is a CFP, Certified Financial Planner, a member of our Christian Financial Advisor Network, and he also manages our very own PACE investment portfolio. If you would like to have a free 30-minute review of your investments with Jay, you can call him at 888-664-6963. That's 888-664-6963. Six six four six nine six three, And when you do, be sure to tell them you heard about him on Follow the Money Weekly Radio. Gold, silver, palladium. If you have questions about or are looking to purchase precious metals, there is one name to know and one name to call. Tom Cloud at 1-800-247-2812. You hear Tom every week on Follow the Money Weekly. And gold and silver are an excellent hedge against inflation. 
Tom Cloud has over 30 years' experience as a precious metals advisor. Don't buy your precious metals through a call center and pay inflated prices. Call Tom Cloud, 1-800-247-2812. And for a limited time, tell Tom you heard it from Jerry Robinson on Follow the Money Weekly and receive free shipping and insurance on your order. That's right. Mention Follow the Money Weekly and your shipping and insurance charges are waived on your precious metals purchase. If you have a question about something you heard on the show, call Tom. And to secure your precious metals investment, call Tom, your gold guy, Tom Cloud, 1-800-247-2812. That's 1-800-247-2812. You heard it on Follow the Money Weekly. How can you find tomorrow's most profitable stocks before Wall Street finds them? Well, many investors are searching for a place to find stocks that can turn a nest egg into a huge fortune. Since 2009, the Tomorrow's Treasures portfolio has produced annualized gains of 28%, turning a $10,000 portfolio into $21,300. Small cap stocks have had an impressive run over the past 87 years. In fact, small cap stocks have produced 12.1% annually compared to just 9.9% for large cap stock, according to research. Now this may seem like just a measly 2.1% each year, but the compound effect over the years is astonishing. Consider this, $10,000 invested in large cap stocks in 1926 would be worth $30 million today. Pretty impressive, right? But $10,000 invested in small cap stocks in 1926 turns into over $160 million. Simply put, if you want to build a fortune over the next decade, you must invest in small cap stocks. In fact, all of the top 10 performing stocks of the past decade were small cap stocks. Chances are the top performing stocks over the next decade will also be small cap stocks. So how can you build a fortune? Well, there's no get-rich-quick formula, but good old-fashioned discipline, hard work, and a thorough screening process can pay huge dividends. That's why the Tomorrow's Treasures portfolio was created to help you find the best small cap stocks today. By investing in underfollowed companies before Wall Street analysts catch on, you can stand to make substantially higher gains as the market drives up share prices. Get started today. Learn how to crush the markets using small cap stocks. The Tomorrow's Treasures portfolio service may just be what you're looking for. Where's my money? Money. 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 Daily bread. Follow the Money Weekly presents the Retirement Minute. Hello, everyone. This is John Burse with this week's Retirement Minute. If you haven't done any asset protection planning, your wealth is vulnerable to potential future creditors, and should the worst happen, you could lose everything. Lawsuits, taxes, accidents, and other financial risks are facts of everyday life, and though you'd like to believe that you're safe, misfortune can befall even the most careful person. So what can you do? First of all, identify your potential loss exposure. Then, implement strategies that are designed to help reduce that exposure without compromising your other estate and financial planning objectives. The simplest way to cope with risk is to shift the risk to an insurance company. This should be your first line of defense. Here are some ways you can use insurance to help protect your assets. You can use life insurance. This provides the beneficiaries of your life insurance policy with funds upon your death so that your assets would not need to be used to pay final expenses and estate taxes. Secondly, use disability income insurance. This will pay benefits to replace part of your earned income while you can't work due to illness or injury so that you can continue to meet your financial obligations like your mortgage or your rent. Third, use health insurance. This will pay medical expenses incurred as a result of an illness or injury so that you do not need to use your assets to pay for them. Fourth, how about long-term care insurance? This will pay for certain in-home and nursing home care expenses, preserving your assets for your heirs. Another insurance would be homeowner's insurance. This will pay for certain property damage and loss so that the property can be repaired or replaced without you having to use your other assets to do so. This also covers certain liability claims. 
Don't forget automobile insurance. This pays for damage to your automobile so that you can fix or replace it. Also, this covers certain liabilities as well and claims. Use an umbrella liability insurance policy. This provides liability protection above and beyond basic coverage provided by homeowners and automobile policies. For business owners, buy professional insurance. This can pay for certain business losses like property damage, business interruptions, liability claims. So you can see that there are many ways of using insurance to be able to help protect your assets. So make sure your financial house is in order by contacting me at 888-914-9909. And I will be more than happy to review your financial situation with you. All right, friends. Well, that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much for choosing to allow me into your life each and every week. It is an honor and a privilege to be a part of yours as well. And as always, I leave you with this final thought. Something for you to think on this week. What is more difficult, to develop new ideas or to escape older ideas? Just something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and I'll see you right back here, God willing, next weekend. God bless. The views and opinions expressed by the guests on Follow the Money Weekly do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Makers Group Financial, LLC. Even though these are proven strategies, Jerry Robinson is not a financial advisor, and his guests are not legal or tax advisors. You should always consult a trained financial advisor and or tax advisor before making any financial decisions. John Burrs is a registered representative of and does offer securities through Sycor Securities Incorporated. Lifetime Decisions Management Incorporated is not a subsidiary of nor controlled by Sycor Securities Incorporated.